Dear colleagues, would you please take your seats so that we can start. We have a tight schedule to deal with all the issues that are on our agenda today. Um, so I remind everybody that, uh, that we should uh, also stick to the speaking times. The next item of business on the agenda is a debate under urgent procedure on legal and humanitarian rights aspects of the Russian Federation aggression against Ukraine. Presented by Mr. Damien Cotier on behalf of the Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights. Madam Alexandra Matrichuk, Head of the Center of Civil Liberties, who I welcome very much, and 2022 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, will also make a statement at the beginning of the debate. In order to finish by 12 uh, noon, when the Prime Minister of uh, Iceland, uh, representing the, uh, um, the, the country that is now chairing the Council of Europe, I will have to interrupt the list of speakers at about 11.40 to allow time for the reply and the vote on the draft resolution. Now, first I call Mr. Damien Coutier, rapporteur. You have seven minutes now and three minutes at the end of, uh, uh, of the debate. Damien. Merci, Monsieur le Président. <coughs> Maria avait 15 ans et elle présidait le conseil des élèves de son école. Elle s'intéressait à la musique, elle aimait faire pousser des fleurs et on dit que ces spectacles de danse enchantaient par leur beauté et par leur grâce. Maria est morte ce 14 janvier à Dnipro, avec de nombreux autres civils arrachés à la vie, arrachés à sa famille, par un missile qui a éventré son immeuble. Nous avons tous vu ces images insoutenables. Maria n'aurait pas dû mourir. Elle aurait dû être protégée par ce document, ou plutôt par les successeurs de ce document, ce document est une réplique de l'original de la Convention de Genève, la première Convention de Genève de 1864. Les Conventions de Genève existent pour apporter un peu d'humanité dans l'enfer de la guerre. C'était la volonté des gouvernements qui l'ont négocié et signé à l'époque. Ces conventions, dont mon pays, la Suisse, est fière d'être dépositaire, fixent les règles de la guerre pour protéger les populations populations civiles, les hôpitaux, les écoles, le personnel humanitaire, les soldats blessés, les prisonniers de guerre, etc. Malheureusement, ces conventions, pourtant universellement ratifiées, ne semblent être qu'un bout de papier pour certains. Les attaques russes contre les populations civiles sont innombrables, avec les membres de la sous-commission de dix personnes de cette Assemblée qui s'est rendu en juin dernier à Boucha, Irpin et à Kiev, nous avons pu voir de nos yeux les dégâts immenses perpétrés dans des quartiers d'habitation par des tirs d'obus ou les traces d'exécution du prix Nobel de la paix nous livrera tout à l'heure d'autres témoignages. Merci, madame, de votre présence. Le rapport cite la documentation d'organismes internationaux indépendants tels que le mécanisme de Moscou de l'OSCE, la commission d'enquête indépendante de l'ONU ou le Haut-Commissariat des Nations Unies aux droits de l'homme. Et il faut bien constater et de rappeler aux États partis à la Convention sur le génocide que s'ils ont connaissance d'un risque sérieux de génocide, alors ils ont l'obligation Monsieur le Président, de le prévenir. Monsieur le Président, chers et chers collègues, le rapport propose que l'Assemblée appelle les États à soutenir davantage les enquêtes du procureur de la CPI et du procureur général d'Ukraine, en renforçant leurs capacités, en fournissant des ressources et de l'expertise, notamment, mais pas uniquement dans le domaine des violences sexuelles. Le rapport souligne aussi que les autorités ukrainiennes doivent, ukrainiennes doivent enquêter sur toutes les allégations de crimes, y compris celles commises par leurs propres forces, comme ils en ont l'obligation. Notre Assemblée doit aussi appeler une nouvelle fois les dirigeants de la Russie à leurs obligations internationales en les sommant de cesser immédiatement ce conflit et les graves violations du droit international. Elle appelle elles appellent aussi le Belarus à cesser d'aider à commettre ces crimes. Monsieur le Président, Victor était un joyeux trentenaire, amoureux de la vie, de sa famille, de son pays. Il était un des meilleurs monteurs de cinéma d'Ukraine. Rocker, bassiste, 
fan de musique électro. Le 24 février, il n'a pourtant pas hésité. Il a emmené sa femme et sa fille dans un endroit sûr. Il est allé s'engager dans l'armée pour défendre son pays. Il est vite devenu commandant d'une unité. Fin décembre, Victor a été tué par un tir d'artillerie ennemi près de la ligne de front. Victor n'aurait pas dû mourir parce que cette guerre n'aurait pas dû avoir lieu. Selon le droit humanitaire, Victor, comme les autres soldats au combat, n'est pourtant pas une cible prohibée. Contrairement au meurtre de civils, il ne s'agit pas d'un crime de guerre, mais des conséquences du conflit lui-même. Et pourtant, sa mort reste inacceptable, parce que le déclenchement même de ce conflit est illégal selon le droit international impératif et selon la charte des Nations unies et de nombreux autres actes. Voilà pourquoi il est essentiel que non seulement les crimes de guerre et contre l'humanité, compétence de la justice ukrainienne et de la Cour pénale internationale, soient poursuivis, mais aussi le crime d'agression, à savoir la décision de déclencher le conflit, le crime le plus grave d'entre tous, car il est à l'origine de tous les autres. Réjouissons-nous donc qu'un nombre croissant d'organisations internationales et d'États soutiennent cette proposition, déjà acceptée à l'unanimité par notre Assemblée en avril 2022, sur la suite du rapport de notre collègue Pochier. L'Assemblée était la première instance internationale à, 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 à prendre une décision dans ce sens. L'Assemblée parlementaire de l'OSCE, puis le Parlement européen, puis la Commission européenne et un grand nombre de gouvernements sont allés dans ce sens depuis pour combler un vide juridictionnel, puisque la Cour pénale internationale n'a pas la compétence de juger du crime d'agression en l'absence d'une résolution du Conseil de sécurité des Nations unies. Est-ce que ce sera un obstacle à la paix si nous créons ce tribunal, Monsieur le Président Eh bien non, au contraire, je suis convaincu qu'une paix durable ne peut être construite que si la justice est rendue. Un tel tribunal donnerait un signal clair à tous les gouvernements qui songeraient à l'avenir à lancer une guerre illégale. Il y a des conséquences, elles sont personnelles et elles peuvent être lourdes. Le rapport ne prend pas position sur la forme exacte de ce tribunal, ni sur sa base légale. Il existe plusieurs possibilités, nous les citons. Il est aujourd'hui important que l'Assemblée appelle les États, et notamment les chefs d'État et de gouvernement du Conseil de l'Europe, qui se réuniront à Reykjavik en mai, pour un sommet à soutenir la création de ce tribunal. La forme exacte devra être déterminée par le consensus des États qui doit se former. Le rôle de l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies nous semble très important et le rappel à la définition du crime d'agression qui figure dans le statut de Rome également. Et puis il sera important, pour être cohérent, que les États euh, euh, ratifient également le statut de Rome, y compris l'Ukraine, ainsi que les amendements de, Compal, de Kampala. Enfin, Monsieur le Président, c'est le troisième chapitre de mon rapport, il ne peut y avoir de responsabilité complète pour l'agression et les violations du droit sans réparation des dommages. Les systèmes d'établissement de la responsabilité étatique de la Russie s'avéreront certainement insuffisants, puisque la Convention ne s'applique plus malheureusement depuis le 16 septembre 2022. Il faudra que notre Conseil de l'Europe trouve d'autres mécanismes et nous proposons un mécanisme international d'indemnisation qui aurait pour première étape un registre international des dommages pour consigner les preuves et les demandes d'indemnisation. L'Assemblée générale des Nations unies l'a demandé. Le Conseil de l'Europe a des compétences dans ce domaine et nous pouvons avancer avec un pas concret. D'autres questions juridiques devront être traitées. Ce rapport n'est pas le dernier, le travail doit continuer dans cette Assemblée. Mais aujourd'hui, l'Assemblée peut envoyer un message fort. Maria, Victor et tous les autres devraient être parmi nous. Il ne peut pas y avoir de paix durable sans justice. Merci beaucoup, cher Damien, pour ton introduction. Dear colleagues, before starting the debate on the, re, the legal and human, human rights aspects of Russian Federation aggression against Ukraine, it is an honor for me to give the floor first to the head of the Center of Civil Liberties and 2022 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Madam Alexandra Mat Matvichuk. Dear Madam Matvichuk, dear Alexandra, we are so happy to have you here with us today. Uh, in this Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Russia's war of aggression against your country has caused profound suffering in Ukraine. 
with thousands of civilians killed, and injured, and countless seeking refugee elsewhere in the country or elsewhere in Europe. This night, when we were sleeping, citizens in Ukraine were alarmed by new, a new wave of attacks uh, and uh, 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 new uh, places of destruction were, were created by, in this war of aggression. New crimes were committed. Dear Alexandra, you and your Center of Civil Liberties are making an outstanding effort to document these war crimes, human rights abuses and abuse of power, demonstrating the significance of civil society for peace and democracy. If I may, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge your great work, your efforts, and your personal deep commitment towards promoting human rights and democracy in Ukraine. It is for good reasons that you did receive the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in 2022. Dear Alexandra, your wise thoughts and your vast experience, also horrible experience in this respect, are therefore of great interest for us, especially in this debate. So I'm so happy that you are here with us today and I'm quite sure that the colleagues are going to listen with more than great interest to uh, your introduction uh, before we start this debate. You have the floor, Alexandra. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a human rights defender and I have been documenting war crimes in this war which Russia started in 2014. Back then, Ukraine obtained a chance for the quick democratic transformation after the collapse of the authoritarian regime. In order to stop us on this way, Russia started this war and occupied Crimea and part of Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Because Putin is not afraid of NATO. Putin is afraid of the idea of freedom. After the large-scale invasion, we face with unprecedented amount of war crimes. Russian troops deliberately destroy residential buildings, churches, schools, hospitals, attack evacuation corridors, establish filtration camps system, organize forcible deportations, commit abductions, rapes, tortures, and murder civilians in the occupied territories. This is the conscience policy. Russia uses war crimes as a method of warfare. Russia attempts to break people's resistance and occupy the country by means of inflicting the immense pain on civilians. We document this pain. In just 10 months, our joint efforts have documented 31,000 war crimes. I interviewed hundreds of people who survived Russian captivity. They told how they were beaten, raped, electrically shocked through their genitalia, and their nails were torn away, their nails were drilled, they were compelled to write with their own blood. One lady reported how her eye was dug out with a spoon. There is no military justification for such actions. Russians did these horrific things only because they could. I ask myself the question, whom do we document all of it for? We face with accountability gap problem. The Ukrainian legal system is overloaded with an extreme amount of war crimes. But the International Criminal Court restricts its investigation to just several selected cases and has no jurisdiction over the crime of aggression in terms of Russian aggressions against Ukraine. Hence, who will provide justice for all victims of this war? I work with people who have survived hell and I'm certain that above and beyond their ruined lives, ruined families, ruined vision of the future. These people crave to restore their trust that justice exists, even though delaying time. It's crucial not only for Ukraine, 
This is not a war of two states. This is a war of two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. Putin attempts to convince the world that democracy, rule of law and human rights are fake values. If they are genuine, why do they fail to defend anyone? Why couldn't the whole UN system stop Russian atrocities? Why do I, human rights lawyer, who has been applying the law to defend people for many years, presently have to answer the question of how to contribute to people's survivors in the occupied territories by saying, provide Ukraine with modern weaponry. Because for now, the law doesn't work, although I trust that it's temporary. In 20th century, the civilized world made a significant step to establish law and justice. At the Nuremberg trials, war crime perpetrators were tried after the Nazi regime had collapsed. In the 21st century, we must move further. Justice must be independent from the magnitude of Putin's regime's power. We cannot wait. We must establish a special tribunal on the crime of aggression now and hold Putin, Lukashenko and other guilty of this crime accountable. Yes, this is a courageous step, but we have one strong argument. We must do it because it's the right thing to do. The Council of Europe, as an international organization which protects democracy, rule of law and human rights, must take the leading position in it. The values of modern civilization must be protected. And one more important point. Beside the crimes of aggression, there are other international crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. These crimes don't have to remain only in our archives and reports of the international organizations. The war has turned people into numbers. The scale of war crime grows so large that it's become impossible to recognize all the stories. But I will tell you one. Shortly after the large-scale invasion began, Alexander Shalipov, a 62-year-old civilian, was killed by the Russian military near his own house. This tragedy did receive huge media attention only because it was the first court trial after February 24th. In the court, Alexander's wife, Katerina, shared that her husband was an ordinary farmer but he was her whole universe, and now she lost everything. And this is the key meaning of justice. We must ensure justice for all, regardless of who the victims are, their social position, the type and level of cruelty they endured, and whether the media is interested in their case. We need to return people their names because life of each person matters. The member states of Council of Europe have to assist the legal system of Ukraine to make it capable to effectively investigate and bring to responsibility for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. We must ingrain international element into the level of national investigation and national justice. We need to create a hybrid mechanism where national investigators work together with international investigators. National judges work together with international judges. Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe should state the need to increase technical support and financing in order to strengthen the capacity of the overburdened law enforcement agencies and judicial system of Ukraine so that in cooperation with international partners and civil society to investigate numerous international crimes and ensure justice for everyone. 
in order to achieve justice, it should be contributed by the International Criminal Court and European countries' domestic courts, which are able to consider many cases under the universal jurisdiction. Honorable delegates of the Parliamentary Assembly, we highly appreciate the political will expressed by many countries and international organizations to prosecute the political leadership of Russia and Belarus for the committed crime of aggression. It's time to transform this will into the decision empowering to launch legal procedures. The fight for justice should not be limited only to the crime of aggression. We require the support of foreign professionals, judges, prosecutors and detectives in order to properly investigate and ensure court proceeding for dozens of thousands of international crimes in compliance with the standards of justice, particularly the Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Sustainable peace, which provides freedom from fear and long perspective. It's impossible without justice. For decades, Russian troops have been committing war crimes in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Georgia, in Mali, in Libya, in Syria, in other countries of the world. And they enjoyed impunity. Russians believe they can do whatever they want. We must break the circle of impunity, not only for Ukrainians, not only for the other people who suffered from Russian brutality, but for the people who can become the next target of Russian aggression and prevent it this time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Alexandra. And I am sure that the applause illustrates that we have heard your call to us parliamentarians representing 46 member states of the Council of Europe that we do not only have to show support in principle, but also in practice and you have informed us about the magnitude of the work that lies ahead in order to achieve what we all in principle say that justice has to be done to the victims of this crime of aggression, this war of aggression in, uh, in, uh, of, of the Russian Federation in Ukraine. Thank you very much. I think this helps us in the, in the, in the debate that we are now going to start. We first are going to listen to the five speakers of the political groups. Uh, and uh, as the first speaker, uh, our colleague Edward Leach from the United Kingdom, representing the ECDA group, will uh, uh, start his contribution to the debate. Edward, you have the floor. President, it's uh, an honour to open this debate on behalf of my group, and it's even more of an honour to follow the last speech, which was truly inspiring. Uh, it almost brought a tear to our eyes when we heard of that poor farmer. He, to the world he may have been a farmer, but to his family he was the universe. And this explains the appalling emotional and cruel impact of this war. And the other phrase that we heard in that inspiring speech was that Putin in reality is not afraid of NATO, that is a lie. He is afraid of the concept of freedom. And that is what this Council of Europe is all about, justice, and freedom and human rights. There is no doubt that of, uh, there have been numerous atrocities against civilians. The, the United Nations Independent Monitoring Commission uh, under Eric Moes, the independent Norwegian judge, visited many towns and villages. There's been great egregious cruelty to civilians, including 
sexual violence, shooting of the head, cutting of throats. It's appalling. And those who perpetrate this war must be brought to justice to an international, independent tribunal for the crime of aggression. As we've heard, and we heard from our rapporteur at the beginning of this debate, over the last 150 years, we've tried to tame the brutality of war with a mechanism such as the Geneva Convention. But it seems that this Russian aggression has no understanding or fear of the Geneva Convention or anything else. These people must be brought to task. Of course, Europe must put its... Uh, it must do what it must do. It must send the tanks. It must do all it can. We in this council can't send any tanks. We only have our voice. But surely a voice is loud enough. And we have to proclaim that voice loudly. That this is an old-style war of aggression it's not about fear of NATO or anything else. It is simply trying to recreate the Russian Empire. Well, the Russian Empire is over. The era of, of empires is over. The British Empire is over. The French Empire is over. The Turkish Empire is over. What, this is now the era of freedom and independent nations who want their own sovereignty. And that is all that the Ukraine asks for. And that is what we should give them support. So when we say, long live Ukraine, we're not talking about nationalism, we're saying long live freedom and humanity. And I hope you'll forgive me if I quote Winston Churchill who said in 1941, and this could be said of Ukraine now, humanity with all its fears, with all its hopes of future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. Thank you very much, uh, Adford. Next in the debate, I call Mr. George Katrugalis from Greece who speaks on behalf of the UEL group. George, you have the floor. Sir, dear colleagues, uh, recently the president of our assembly suggested to me to read again the preamble of the statutes of our organization. There I found uh, this uh, remarkable phrase that uh, it is very pertinent to what we are discussing. I quote, peace based upon justice and international cooperation is vital for the preservation of human society and civilization." Unquote. Exactly for this reason, because peace and justice and international cooperation cannot be dissociated, we remain very skeptical for the establishment of an ad hoc tribunal which could undermine the moral authority and the legal jurisdiction of the ICC. I remind you that after the amendments of Kabbalah of 2010, aggression is the fourth core crime that ICC can have under its jurisdiction. But unfortunately, we have only 44 ratifications for this agreement. United Kingdom has not ratified, neither France, nor my own country, Greece. This is butter to the bread of the Russian propaganda, that the invasion is not a violation of international legality, but just an incident of the quarrel of the dispute between the West and Russia. So, I suggest that we push our countries for the ratification of the Kabbalah Agreement, try to found through the General Assembly of the United Nations a way that the procedural issues that remain should be overcome. The second point of my intervention, dear colleagues, is the other thing that our status remind us, peace. I'm not at all a proponent of the cynical realism in international relations, but I found very interesting the recent article of Kissinger to Spectator. You, you must have read it, it is entitled how to avoid another world war. And among analogies with the current situation and the situation in the first world war, which could have ended in uh, 1916, he suggests that it is time for a negotiated peace in Ukraine. And also, I quote, he warns 
against the dreams of breaking up Russia, which could unleash nuclear chaos. So, the uh, European institutions and the European countries should also proceed with initiatives for peace. Peace, of course, respecting fully the Ukrainian sovereign rights, because peace and justice are un un uh, dissociated. Thank you. Thank you, George. Next in the debate, I call uh, Suna Ivasotti from Iceland, and she speaks on behalf of the Group of Socialists, Democrats and Greens. Suna, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Impunity for war crimes is a driving factor for war crimes. The fact that perpetrators of war crimes very often escape justice is a big reason why war crimes are so readily committed in conflicts all over the world. And this is why we must do our very best to end impunity for war crimes. In the case of Russia's horrendous war of aggression against Ukraine, there is not only impunity for war crimes, but the terrible practice of Russian soldiers being awarded for war crimes with medals and promotions. And we have seen with our own eyes, those of us who participated in the fact-finding visit to Kiev, Irpin and Butcha last year, that Russia's strategy of attack is to attack civilian targets on purpose and on a massive scale. Schools, kindergartens, hospitals, shopping malls, apartment buildings, and even playgrounds were destroyed by Russian bombs. I witnessed with my own eyes the devastation caused by this genocidal invasion. Seeing a clothes rack with what used to be cl clean laundry left to dry in someone's laundry room, left bare by a bomb that had opened the entire apartment. Seeing a kitchen table with coffee cups and cutlery standing on a ledge of rubble, spotting a teddy bear in the ruins left by Russian bombs, made one thing very clear to me and my colleagues, that the biggest crime of all is the war itself. That is why, dear colleagues, this report is so important because it lays out a roadmap to justice. We must try Putin and his accomplices for the crime of aggression. We must set up a special tribunal on the crime of aggression to bring them to justice. Because to end war crimes, we must end impunity of war crimes. And to end wars, we must end impunity for the crime of all crimes against peace, the crime of aggression. Dear colleagues, I speak not only for myself, but for all of us in the Socialist Democrats and Greens group, when I ask you to support this report, with all of the important recommendations it contains, and also when I thank the Rapporteur for setting before us a roadmap to justice. And on behalf of all of us in the group of Socialist Democrats and Greens, I declare our full solidarity with the brave people of Ukraine and our strong hope for peace for your nation. Thank you. Thank you, Suna. Now in the debate, I call Madam Maria Valentina Martinez Ferro from Spain, and she speaks on behalf of the EPP group. Maria, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would like to thank and congratulate Mr. Cotier and the Secretariat for this important and excellent report about the legal and human rights aspect of this terrible war. We, as the EPP group, would like to strengthen the importance of two points that we have heard here this morning. The need to establish a new Nuremberg Tribunal to judge the terrible crimes and provide justice and hope to all the Ukrainians. And secondly, the compensation that Russia Federation should pay for the dreadful destruction. Since 2014, Russia has been committing numerous crimes on the territory of Ukraine. But since February 2022, the scale of these crimes has become unprecedented. Bucha, Irpin, Gostomel, Bordi, Bordodianka, Mariupol, Itzium became cities known to everyone in the world for the horror and destruction they are suffering. We need to bring justice to those involved in committing 
of international crimes, including war crimes, crimes against humanity and the crime of genocide, as soon as possible. There is an unprecedented involvement of other countries in the investigation of crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine with the joint investigation team. And there is also an important involvement of the International Criminal Court that unfortunately has, does not have the authority to investigate the crime of aggression against Ukraine. Therefore, we must take the initiative and create such a mechanism that will be able to investigate and prosecute the highest political and military leadership of the U Russian Federation for committing the crime of aggression against Ukraine. Such a mechanism is the special tribunal for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. To this end, Ukraine has proposed to submit a draft resolution on the creation of such a mechanism to the UN General Assembly for consideration. The creation of this special tribunal opens a window of opportunity for that part of Russian elites who realize that Putin's, Putin's regime is leading Russia into an abyss. We need a new Nuremberg trial. The second point is that Russia, the aggressor, uh, should be... Um, it was, is causing enormous destruction on the territory of Ukraine. Shattered cities, damaged environment, ecosystem, crippled economy, amidst massive human losses. Therefore, there is a need to create a new and innovative compensation mechanism to collect, assess and ultimately provide compensation for hundreds of thousands of claim, claims against the Russian Federation for direct losses stemming from the aggressions against Ukraine. The main concept of the international compensation mechanism is the construction of a coherent system that could ensure real compensation for damages caused by aggression. Therefore, as the report stresses, we should establish the international registry of damages to record in documentary form of evidence and claims, information or lo on losses, injuries and damages to all legal and natural persons concerned, as well as the state of Ukraine caused by Russia. Finally, we would like to welcome the decision of all the countries who have decided to continue supporting Ukraine with all the necessary means, economical, political, and of course, military. It is the right thing to do, as Alexandra has just said. I would like to Thank express you. our solidarity and gratitude to the brave Ukrainians who continue their fight for our freedom and values, the values of this Council of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Sorry for interrupting you, but if we want to give as many uh, uh, members as possible the floor, then we have to stick to three minutes. Next uh, in the debate, on the last speaker on behalf of the political groups is Mr. Eric Niels Cross from Estonia, and he speaks on behalf of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats in Europe. Eric Niels, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first, uh, I would like to uh, uh, congratulate Damien Potier for this uh, very important uh, report. Uh, we are quite pleased with, with the outcome. Um, the Russian escalated war of aggression against Ukraine has lasted for almost a year, and it feels like a long time, but it's not. For anyone between Russia and Germany, this is unfortunately a regular occurrence because there is a tradition of Russian imperial aggressive wars against its neighbors going back to at least 1918. It's at least a hundred years of Russian imperial wars and those wars have two things in common. One, they have violated international law. Two, the planners, initiators and perpetrators of these wars have never been tried nor sentenced. There was never Nuremberg for Russian aggressive wars, and the victims of these aggressions never saw justice. There is a very sad tradition uh, of a vicious cycle of impunity of Russian war criminals that we are still living in Europe. Be it war against Georgia in 1921 or 2008, against Finland 1939, Hungary 1956, the Baltic States 1940, the list is long. All these wars have been conducted violating international laws, all these wars have been fought in violating Geneva Conventions, and almost all of them have clearly been aggressions, violating use ad bellum, the right to war, 
at least since the, the crime of aggression was defined in 1928. Um, and today we again are saying with this report and with our speeches uh, no more impunity for crime of aggression, no more impunity for crime of genocide, no more impunity for crimes against humanity, uh, no more impunity for war crimes. But as the German foreign minister told us just two days ago, declarations are not enough. No, this report outlines some steps that must be taken now to make sure that the criminals in this war will be punished. We need an international special tribunal to investigate and try the crime of aggression, the mother of the war crimes. As the Nuremberg judgment says, war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime, differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. Therefore, it's alarming that the world in a hundred years has not been able to agree upon a court that would have universal jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. We need to set up a tribunal for Russian aggressors. We need to, we need to reform the ICC system and Rome statute so that this kind of court would be there in the future. And we uh, in ALDE particularly welcome the recommendation to immediately set up an ad hoc prosecutor's office for the special tribunal, even if the tribunal itself has not yet been formed. We should Thank you. address this in Reykjavik. And to sum it up, the report is good. We need to keep pushing this. Freedom of Ukraine depends on victory in war. Thank you. Freedom of Russia depends on ending the vicious cycle of impunity. And the yeah. future of Europe depends Sorry. not only on Ukrainian victory, but on the end of impunity of aggressors. Thank you. Thank you, Eric Niels. But please, colleagues, stick to the three minutes. It's a matter of solidarity to get so many, as many people involved as possible in the debate. Next in the debate, I call Mr. Darko Kafsky from North Macedonia. Darko, we have the floor. Your microphone, please. The other one. Thank you, Mr. President. First of all, I want to send congratulations to excellent report to Mr. Kotia. Every democratic state stands in solidarity with Ukraine and continues to support the Ukrainian people. Thousands of people have been killed as a result of Russian brutal invasion of Ukraine. Civilian infrastructure, like including kindergartens, schools, universities, hospitals, buildings, houses and cultural centers are being targeted every day. The armed attack of the Russian Federation on Ukraine has led to a grave decline of the human rights in the country with thousands of civilians killed and injured, torture and ill treatment. 18,000 victims are documented since the beginning of the aggression. The real number of dead or injured people is much higher. There are millions of Ukrainian refugees across Europe and almost 5 million are internally displaced. We call on Russia to immediately end the attack. This war endangers Europe and the future of our security and our democracies depend on it. The price to pay is on every one of us. We must not tolerate the daily killing of civilians, the horrible torture and the other violence of human rights. Russian forces are also devastating environment in which the people are living. There are explosions and fires endangering the air with toxic gases and threatening the safety of the nuclear reactors. The destruction of the industrial facilities is contaminating the waters and the soil with chemicals. All leaders of democracies should immediately act. This is a lesson for every one of us, and we must remember that all autocracies are dangerous and a threat to, to the peace. The radical extremist narratives are not to be trusted and we should cancel right away. This is why we should act to stop every emerging dangerous opinion in every democratic society. We must act jointly and make a strategic change to ensure the future for the new generations. In the coming times, we have to strengthen the regional cooperation even more, eliminate the potential for new conflicts, and ensure the stability and the safety for all. Once again, we are standing in solidarity with Ukraine and condemn Russian unprovoked military aggression. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Darko, and sticking to the speaking time. Now in the debate, I call Mr. Emanuel Zingers from Lithuania. Thank you, Tinia. Uh, 
Uh, uh, dear Tini, we were first from international organizations, not only to condemn, but structurally to evaluate. After 24th of February, this terrible second wave of terror from Russia Federation against Ukraine, who is now firm member, candidate member of European Union. From my point of view, my question is how this organization will lead, among other international organizations, the fight against terror set up on us, on Europe, by biggest <coughs> dictatorship in the world. So, what to do? Damian, thank you for your report, and I was glad to initiate on the beginning motion of resolution, if you remember, and I'm very glad that your efforts were so scrupulous. But we should be one step ahead. Yesterday, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Germany spoke that all credentials, Europe and even the European Union, will shift to this organization for evaluation of the next steps. So, do we should assemble in Reykjavik, in the country who was first to recognize independence of the Baltic countries, Iceland, in the cradle of democracy like Iceland, only to, uh, uh, to say what we think or to settle institutions? <coughs> institutions should be settled. And of course, Tini, you will ask me that same, that's only Europe. It's not Africa, it's not Latin America, it's in, not enough voices for like-minded countries to establish international tribunal. International tribunal uh, to evaluate all those levels of war of aggression and other levels and to uh, go ahead. But the finances should be set. Two years ago, somebody raised the question that Russia will not pay contribution to European Union budget. I'm sorry. Shame of those who raised the question. Is the question, from our side, is the question not is, is what is in the head of Mr. Putin in how to avoid the Third World War and nuclear bombing. Our question is how to defend the democratic world and how to cement that. How to cement democratic world together and Council of Europe should be an organization going ahead with this cementation in the world if United Nations organizations are failing. Tini, allow Thank me you, to... Thank you, Ivanovic. Uh, yes, Tini, sorry. allow me uh, to show no, the sorry. sound. No, sorry, we now have passed the three minutes. Everybody yes. will now have three minutes. Next in the debate, I call Madam Larisa Bilosev from Ukraine. You have the floor, Larisa. Dear Mr. President, dear colleagues, I would like to commend a reporter, Damian, Mr. Damian Katia, for this excellent report, as it is of utmost importance at the time when already 18, uh, 11 months Putin is destroying with impunity an in entire state in Europe in front of the eyes of the civilized world, trying to wipe off the face of the earth's Ukrainian nation violating, I would say, raping the international law in most perverted manner. I am convinced that this report will for sure encourage and send a clear message to the international community that perpetrators of war crimes and crimes against humanity, crime of aggression, can be and will be held accountable. Thank you, Damien, for enormous work that you have done, not only by preparing this report, but also that on April, together with 10 of your colleagues of ad hoc subcommittee, made a brave fact-finding um, mission to Ukraine, thoroughly gathering information from Ukrainian authorities on crimes committed by Russians in order to focus on system of accountability for the crime. I remember, as we spent very tough and very busy day meeting with prosecutor generals, with the authorities, visiting Bucha, Irpin, and this time general prosecutor reported to you about 20,000 war crimes committed by the Russian occupiers. I must inform you, today, after nine months after you visit, this number increased by four times. 
Ukraine recorded already 80,000 crimes, including the murder of more than 9,000 civilians, including murder of 453 children, and this is just a tip of iceberg. The aggressor still consistently continues to cause new destructions on the territory of my country. Our land is literally bleeding. Every day, the best people of our country give up their life to protect our land. Civilians are dying, and we are still in the stage of discussion and resolutions, but not concrete deeds, and actions on special international courts and reparations from the Russian frozen funds. But we need only, not only words, but deeds. So far, the proposals to create a special tribunal for aggression has received the support first in the PACE, then in the European Parliament, the European Commission, Parliament, the Assembly of the NATO. But let's give up words in favor of deeds, finally. Today, Ukrainians are simply killed because they are Ukrainians. Each day, more and more young people give their lives to protect our sovereignty and freedom. You even don't even imagine how, for me, as a majoritarian, hard to go to funerals or my constituency and to see very young, brave, best people dead. How people, local communities, bend their knees, meet in funerals, cars from the front to see the whole universe of the families being ruined forever. We are grateful to our allies for support. We need your support and weaponry to stop the destruction of Ukraine. Putin's regime must pay a fair price for bringing war to Europe. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Larisa. Next speaker is Mr. Akin Gadirli from Azerbaijan. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dear colleagues, uh, I feel very proud to be part of this organization at this particular time of the history because I see how unanimous we are and how full-heartedly we support Ukraine. Be it committee meetings or plenary sessions, all the resolutions, reports and discussions were, I saw the unanimity. And this particular report was also unanimously adopted in the legal committee, which I'm also a proudly member of. And I'm very grateful to our chairman, who happens to be the rapporteur, uh, and who also led our team in our visit to Kiev, Bucha, Irpin. Um, but I can't help to mention one particular point. Um, had this organization or international community at large paid enough attention and took all necessary steps with regard to occupation of territories of Azerbaijan, Georgia and Moldova, the war against Ukraine probably wouldn't have happened. Um, international community paved the way for Russian aggression by being not attentive enough to previous facts of occupation of member states of this great organization. This report is excellent. It, we discussed it at length in our committee. By saying at length, I do not mean to imply that there were some disputes or arguments or disagreements. No, because it, was a leg, because it is a legal report, it requires precision, concretizations, detailizations. So that is why we had to be careful when we're, choosing, when we're choosing terms. This report focused mainly on the establishment of an ad hoc tribunal to investigate uh, uh, the crime of aggression, which nowadays is impossible to do in the ICC because Russia is not a member of ICC and the, Council, and the Security Council of the United Nations cannot refer this crime to the ICC because we all know that Russia is going to veto it. Um, again, without taking much of your time and as you recommended to save time for other speakers, I've finished my words by fully supporting this report and I'm sure that we, this report will also be unanimously adopted. Slava Ukraine. Thank you, Arkin. Now we are going to listen to Madam Anne-Marie Viro Virola-Inen from Finland. Anne-Marie, you have the floor. 
Mr. President, dear colleagues, thanks to Mr. Cotier for the excellent report. And I also want to thank uh, Ms. Matvuchik for your emotional speech. Russia has violated international humanitarian law in its assault on sovereign Ukraine for an almost a year. Tens of thousands of Ukrainians have died or been wounded in defense of their home country. Millions have been forced to either leave their homes or live in inhumane conditions with little water, heat, food or shelter and with constant fear. Russians' atrocities are clear and conscious acts against humanity. Besides its illegal assault, genocide and war crimes, Putin's Russia poses also a threat to global security. By attacking Ukraine, it is attacking the world where people want to interact, compete and cooperate peacefully by common rules and mutual respect. Dear colleagues, the Russian Federation rhetoric against Ukraine provably incites genocide. All states party to the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Cr Crime of Genocide have duty to prevent and punish it. I strongly advocate the creation of a special international criminal tribunal for prosecuting the crimes R Russia has committed in Ukraine. I call all states, international organization and the whole international community to support the establishment of this tribunal. There is no other way for more secure and just tomorrow than to ident identify and prosecute re the responsible Russian political and military, military leaders for their war crimes. For this, I also strongly urge member states to support the investigation of Russian war gr crimes against humanity and genocide by the ICC prosecutor. For a successful in investigation, the Ukrainian authorities must be supported with sufficient resources and expertise. Finally, I want to reaffirm the call to set up an inter international compensation mechanism for repairing the damage caused to Ukraine and its citizens. As an organization for defending democracy, human rights and rule of law, the Council of Europe can be effectively lead its setup and management. Finally, it is our obligation to help people that have survived the hell and find the road to justice. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, uh, Anne-Marie. Next in the debate, I call Mr. Ahmed Yildiz from Turkey. Ahmed. President, dear colleagues, Russia's unjustified war of aggression against Ukraine is about to enter second year, and there certainly does not appear to be an end in sight to this war. As the destruction continues, civilians are paying the highest price. Since October, we are witnessing indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks, civil missile strikes at multiple urban locations, especially targeting civilian infrastructure. And this continues with alarming frequency. In this regard, I thank the rapporteur for elaborating on how we could hold those responsible for atrocities to account. First and foremost, as suggested in the report, all relevant international conventions, in particular with regard to the protection of civilians, should be upheld and all obligations under international human rights and humanitarian law must be respected. Allegations and some factual scenes about crimes perpetrated under the fog of war should be investigated and the facts should be clearly established. This process should be transparent and credible. I would like to reiterate my support for a true inquiry into crimes committed during the conflict. Dear colleagues, as I explained in other meetings, that Turkey had tried to establish a long-term comprehensive strategic relationship with Ukraine before this war of aggression. Unfortunately, this aggression happened. It couldn't be aborted. It couldn't be uh, deterred by the international community. 
the conditions in the Black Sea, the Turkish geopolitical location, and international uh, conditions put Turkey in a unique situation, in a unique position to do something that others cannot do. As a Black Sea riparian state and as responsible for implementation of the Montreal Convention, some of them are about these military things, some are about civilian aspects such as uh, helping uh, uh, helping manage this grain corridor, exchange of prisoners, maybe in the future about generation of power for the civilians, uh, for the Ukrainian people. I am uh, proud that Turkish diplomacy, military and political leadership plays this role in favor of Ukraine without forgetting that Russia is the aggressor, Ukraine is the victim. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Now you are going to listen to Mr. Paolo Pisco from Portugal. Paolo, you have the floor. So to Ms. Uh, Alexandra Matvichuk for important speech and for the courageous work that uh, she and the organization are doing. Colleagues, all the atrocities committed by Russian armies in Ukraine show with no doubt that human rights are being violated in all dimensions and that we are in face of all kinds of war crimes from aggression to genocide, absolute lack of humanity, indiscriminate killings, destruction of entire cities, use of forbidden weapons, destruction, uh, violence, torture, forcibly displaced children and helpless persons, the forced adoptions of children by Russian families and the process of Russification by deleting Ukrainian identities is an horrible crime that we should vehemently denounce. The absurd of the situation is that in spite of the huge amount of proofs and evidences of all kinds that are being collected by an important international coalition and several international courts, the Russian political and military perpetrators of all those crimes may not come to judgment and condemnation. So complex are the mechanisms of international justice. That possibility is a nightmare that should not happen. As it is totally absurd that in face of the tragedy of the war in Ukraine, the United Nations are blocked because of the veto power of Russia, something that is not tolerable for the future. In the barbaric war in Syria, Bashar al-Assad crossed the red line using chemical weapons, and nevertheless, he still lives in impunity, ruling the country, never being judged, what shows the limitations and constraints of international law and how the force of law became weaker and the world more unpredictable and dangerous. If after the war there will be no justice, justice or unsatisfactory condemnations to all crimes committed, we will be hurting very badly the value of international law and all conventions that patiently we have been built along decades to bring civilization and humanity to the world. It is also a dangerous precedent because there are always countries that will feel more confident to aggress other nations and commit so many crimes as those that are now being committed by Russia. This report and its recommendations deserve full support of this chamber, but we also must appeal to the Council of Europe and to all international organizations to speed up this process and work for an international justice less complex, much faster and more effective to condemn war and crimes war crimes and criminals, and therefore to contribute to build a new architecture of international justice for a world more fair, safe and free. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Now we are going to listen to Madam Ingrid Skau from Norway. Ingrid, you have the floor. President and colleagues, first of all, uh, let me commend our rapporteur, Mr. Cotier, for having prepared a thorough report on an urgent matter. Russia must be held accountable for their aggression against Ukraine. The international community must come together to establish a special international tribune, tribunal. And President, nearly a year has passed since February 24, 2022. The Ukrainian people are having their lives ruined by war. They have suffered from the actions of their neighbors, not only since last year, but since 2014, when Crimea was illegally annexed. We, what we will examine today, 
So it is how to hold Russia accountable for the act of aggression and how to ensure accountability for war crimes, crimes against humanity and possible genocide. After February the 24th, of our, our assembly was quick to act. Our organization, the Council of Europe, excluded a member. There was no doubt that Russia's actions were in breach of the statute of the Council of Europe. And President, when it comes to war, it is rarely as clear as it is now. Russia is the aggressor of the war. How can we hold Russia and the political and military leadership to account? Our international system of justice is not rigid for the situation we are in. Our organization, the OSCE, the United Nations and many others of our multilateral structures were founded in the wake of the Second World War. They were established to prevent history to repeat itself prevent another world war, for humankind to live in peace with their human rights respected. Now we are in the situation where one of the visitors of 1940, the victors of 1945, is the aggressor. An aggressor with a seat in the United Nations Security Council, blocking prosecution through the International Crime Criminal Court and President, Mr. Cotier's elaborations on how a special tribunal can be set up and how international crimes committed in Ukraine can be investigated and prosecuted is therefore commendable. When we adopt this draft resolution, we will give a strong signal to our governments to move forward to establish the special tribunal, to make sure that he, uh, heinous crimes committed in Ukraine is not only investigated but also prosecuted to make sure that aggressors and perpetrators are held accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Prochain orateur est Monsieur André Gadolin de la France. André, la parole est à vous. Merci, Monsieur le Président, mes chers collègues. Tout d'abord, Monsieur le Président, je tiens à vous remercier pour l'invitation qui a été faite à Alexandra Matbichuk de s'exprimer ici. Madame, je veux dire toute l'émotion que nous ressentons pour, de manière souvent partielle, avoir été aussi un défenseur de personnes qui ont souffert. Ce que vous devez, au-delà de la dureté de ce que les personnes ont subi, vous-même ressentir est quelque chose de, de terrible. Et je tiens à vous féliciter, vous et votre organisation, et je crois que ce prix Nobel de la paix est pleinement mérité. Vous l'avez dit, vous avez documenté 31 000 crimes de guerre. Et vous l'avez évoqué sobrement, ça a été rappelé euh, il y a quelques instants par notre collègue grec, il y a des crimes de guerre, des crimes, dirais-je, contre l'humanité, que nous pouvons difficilement renseigner. C'est celui de la déportation massive de personnes dans les territoires annexés ou occupés par la Fédération de Russie, des centaines de milliers d'enfants qu'on force à abandonner soit leurs familles, parfois orphelins, mais qui ont aussi des membres ukrainiens chez qui ils pourraient être accueillis, que l'on force à aller sur le territoire de la Fédération de Russie. On crée des décrets spéciaux pour les faire adopter dans des, une rhétorique qu'on retrouve dans la presse propagandiste euh, du Kremlin humanitaire. Ces enfants, que deviennent-ils Quel est l'objectif Quand on lit certains journaux qui nous expliquent que c'est pour procéder à la dénazification qu'on fait la désukrainisation, qu'on va transformer ces enfants en bons petits russes comme on le fait avec les enfants euh, ouïghours en république soi-disant populaire de Chine. Je dis, il y a là un scandale, il y a là des centaines de milliers de cas qui vont être très difficiles à, à renseigner, mais pour lesquels les autorités responsables, et pas seulement militaires, mais politiques, civiles de la Fédération de Russie, devront rendre des comptes. Et cette situation, elle est abominable parce qu'elle relève, à proprement dit, du cas de crime de génocide. Et à un moment, il va falloir que nous osions ce mot quand on procède à une épuration ethnique de territoires 
au nom soi-disant pour protéger les populations russophones d'un soi-disant crime génocidaire, on procède à un génocide de masse, à une destruction d'une culture, à l'asservissement d'enfants, à leur déportation, parce qu'il ne s'agit pas de déplacement forcé, au sens strict du terme, quand on franchit une frontière, c'est une déportation, et eh bien je crois que euh, nous devons aussi nous emparer de cette question. Et puis je conclurai bien évidemment en soulignant euh, le travail excellent fait par notre rapporteur euh, Damien Cotier, que je soutiens pleinement et j'espère que nous voterons à l'unanimité, que les chefs d'État qui se réuniront à Reykjavik s'en empareront et que notre commissaire aux droits de l'homme dans cette institution que je trouve un peu trop silencieuse s'empare pleinement aussi de cette question. Je vous remercie. Merci à vous, André. Now we are going to listen to Mr. Alexei Goncharenko from Ukraine. Alexei, you have the floor. Dear colleagues, many of you here in Kuluars, you ask me, how is life in Ukraine now? I want to show you. First, remember, please, how did you wake up this morning? Remember, I want to show you how Ukrainians woke up this morning. Millions of Ukrainians, including my children, woke up like this this morning and many mornings during this almost one year and new victims already in Ukraine. And we are meeting here for the fifth time from the start of this awful war, aggression, invasion, and Ukraine continues to bleed. Yes, we need new Nuremberg against new Nazis, yes. But first, to may have a Nuremberg, Nazis should be defeated. Before Nuremberg happened, Nazis were defeated in 20th century. And before new Nuremberg will happen, new Nazis should be defeated. That's the first thing. That's why, uh, you know, when here was Minister Baerbock, and she said, that's not a good place to speak about weaponry when we asked her several times. We're here for peace and justice. But you can't achieve peace without weaponry today because there is war. You can't achieve peace by demilitarizing like we're making recommendations and resolutions today. Yes, we are very thankful for all tanks uh, we received. Finally, there is this decision. Thanks for tanks. Thank you, Sean. But before the start of invasion, Russia had more than 13,000 tanks. 13,000. You can't stop Russian tanks by recommendations, words, resolutions, and other things. You need tanks, and not 12, not 31, not 50. And today, the dove of peace is F-16 for Ukraine, is Gripen for Ukraine, is the fighters for Ukraine. So we should do, do this now, now. The winter is not coming, winter already is here. And if you want peace now in the Europe, everybody, I invite you to come to Ukraine. All those politicians in Europe who were not in Ukraine for the moment, I think you are not right, you should come and see everything by your own eyes. No resolutions but weaponry. No speaking but weaponry. No debates but weaponry. Weaponry today to stop the evil. And after this, new Nuremberg. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. Next in the debate, I call Mr. Indrek Saar from Estonia. Indrek, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur Président. Dear colleagues, I'm sure that no one in this hall remains unconvinced that unconvinced that Russia's leadership is a hotbed of imperialist ambitions and that it is re ready to reach its goals by any means available, by violating agreements, lying, torturing and killing innocent people. We might think that after February 24, this has become so painfully obvious that no one could overlook, it, overlook this but sadly, this is not the case. The Russian regime has got away with lying to its people for decades. 
And this huge country has an incredible number of people who have swallowed these lies hook, line and sinker. This means, for example, that many generations have grown up in the knowledge that Second World War, or the Great Patriotic War, as it is called in Russia, was the noble liberation mission of the Russian nation to clean the world of evil. The fact that while doing this, the Russian soldiers raped and butchered their way through Europe with the same savagery that we have now seen in Bucha, Irpin, Mar Mariupol, and in many places in Ukraine, is something that most of the Russians have never, ever been forced to acknowledge. Sad to say that most of the people in Russia have never needed to accept any shame for the fact that their country violently stripped large numbers of Europeans of their opportunity to live in a free society, or that millions of people were deported from their homes, their lives were crashed, because they never faced the truth. This list could go on and on, and we could all add a multiple of examples on how Russia has systematically crushed human rights and international agreements which hold up the civilized world. If we want the world order to continue resting on international agreements, we need to finally hold the aggressor accountable. All of Russia, from its leaders down to every simple hard-working citizen, must realize that everyone is accountable for their actions, and these actions have been unforgivable. We need to be able to tell the truth in a way that reaches every individual. We need to do it for ourselves and for every Russian. Only then will there be hope for Russia as well. This is why we must establish an international special tribunal as soon as possible and to enforce the compensation mechanism for all the material and moral damages that Russia has caused to Ukraine and to the Ukrainian people. I thank the rapporteur and everyone who has contributed to this topic. Thank you. The resulting report is a step in the right direction. Thank you. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Indrek. Now we are going to listen to Mr. Sergei Sobolia from Ukraine. Sergei, you have the floor. Mr. President, dear colleagues, I want to thank the rapporteur for this excellent document because it's not only a document, it's really a new history that you started to write together with us. And it's very important to have a correct definitions in this history. And you did it as a rapporteur and I thank all others who make their excellent work to have, to have the excellent report in this meeting. What kind of definitions? It's not war in Ukraine. It's the Russian aggression against Ukraine. It's very important that we have this definition. It's not like a war. It's the exact date of this war and Russian aggression against Ukraine. It's the February of 2014. And second, it's uh, February of 2022. It's very important to understand this because without these definitions, we can't do another work. The work for future special tribunal. It's very important to understand that it's on, not only war crimes that we analyzed on previous days, sexual war crimes, but it's as well a war crimes of the army of Putin and as well of his private army, Wagner troops. It's very important that we also have this in this report. This report is maybe only the beginning of future reports where we need to analyze step by step what we had to do in the 21st century to analyze how it's possible that new fascist regime who are sitting in this building together with us, who are now still try to protect them on different international organizations, including the United Nations organization. We need to define all this. This report is a very excellent report also because it's a good way 
for NATO countries, for European Union, and maybe for United Nations Organization, how to analyze and to stop the future wars. I think all this together gives us an excellent mechanism how to prevent war and how to stop war. Because war did not start it in Ukraine. It started in Georgia in 2008, and we must understand that we do not stop this war this time. I think that this report, it's only the beginning, but good beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sergei. Now I call on the debate Mr. Kimo Kiljunen from Finland. Kimo. Mr. President, we are having here just now an exceptionally important discussion, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Thanks very much, Madam Alexandra Matvichuk, for your very strong, valuable, and even emotionally touching speech. Thank you very much indeed. You noted that the war which Russia is carrying in Ukraine, they are, Russia is committed many very serious crim, uh, war crimes. And you requested us to consider seriously that we need a special international tribunal to address this. I fully agree. I fully agree. This type, of com this type of war crimes Russia is now committing cannot be without consequences. As you stated, there is no peace without justice. You also said Putin is not afraid of NATO. Putin is afraid of democracy. Indeed. Indeed. Putin is afraid of democracy, which means that he is actually afraid of his own people, his own people's aspirations and rights for democracy, human rights and rule of law. That's what he is battling. Uh, that's what he is afraid. And the democratic will of Ukrainian, similar way like the democratic will of Belarusian people, is the threat. So we can say actually that Ukraine, Ukrainians are not fighting only for their national existence and sovereignty and they own, preserving their own democratic system, but they are also fighting for the Russian people's right for democracy. Lord Edward Leich for EC Group started his presentation here and said that the Ukrainian war ends the Russian, Russian imperial dreams. I also agree with that one. This war is an obsolete. It belongs to the last century. Exactly this is the last battle of collapse of Soviet Union, which has actually gone on, gone on these battles on the former Soviet Union regions 30 years. We know and they, you have listed them very many times here. Mr. Vladimir Putin stated in his Peace for Nation in 2005, saying that the biggest, collab, big, big, biggest uh, <coughs> geopolitical catastrophe was the collapse of the Soviet Union, which obviously implied that the imperial dream was left behind. Mr. Brzezinski has noted you, Russia without Ukraine is not anymore imperial. And that's now actually fact. The national identity is Ukraine is the highest ever. Unfortunately, I would say so, the biggest geopolitical catastrophe wasn't actually the cross of the Soviet Union, but it never materialized President Gorbachev's dreams about common European home. That obviously Thank you. is the aim. Thank you, Kimo. Now in the debate, I call Madam Maria Mazenceva from Ukraine. Maria, you have the floor. Well, dear President, thank you very much. I would like to start my speech from a very important citation. A true soldier is fighting not something which is in front of him or her because he fears. He or she fights something for what he loves at the back of him or her. And colleagues, as a representative of Ukrainian delegation, I would love to tell you that it's not the infrastructure we are fighting daily for. It's not the buildings. It's not the roads. It's our heritage, our genital code, which is freedom, our people, and our history. 
This is a red line we're approaching daily time while hearing the sirens, while receiving text messages of the wounded and dead soldiers, men and women, who are, as of now, standing in Bakhmut, Solidar, and many hotspots of this bleeding but still beating war. I want to let you know that we are, will be having more and more resolutions approaching on deported Ukrainians, which Mr. Pisco will be working on. The numbers are growing. We don't know where our citizens exactly are, but we have one goal, as President Zelensky always says, to bring back everyone home. And I want to congratulate everyone who already did so and came to Ukraine. But I want to pay the tribute to the brilliant work of the rapporteur, of the committee, and everyone who visited us, not only in summer, but through all this time. You are continuing to be the soldiers. I was referring to it at the very beginning of my speech. The soldiers of the diplomatic battle, which is continuing today. And colleagues, this file would have never happened. And we would have never been talking about a new mechanism, special tribunal for the repeated crime of aggression. If not a small but very, very important amendment we passed with you back in March in the report when we excluded Russia because they do not fulfill even one adequate position from what we all believe in in this house. The Council of Europe was created to prevent the wars to prevent genocides, to provide erasion of nations. But as of now, we, as the true soldiers of diplomacy, have to fight and create new mechanisms to respond to this brutal war, which could have overlapped further to Europe, if not the resistance within Ukraine. Colleagues, today many cities of Ukraine were hit again, and there are dead and wounded people. I want to tell you a huge thank you for everything you're doing at your national parliaments, in your homes, in your constituencies. Please continue to stand with Ukraine, because we stand for you every second back home. Thank you, Maria. The last orator in this debate will be Mr. Bertrand Poux de la France. Bertrand. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Euh, mes chers collègues, tout d'abord saluer, euh, comme il a été dit, euh, notre rapporteur pour l'excellence de, euh, de son rapport, ainsi que tout le travail fait par la Commission. Les violations des droits de l'homme sont quotidiennes en Ukraine. Elles sont le fait des membres euh, réguliers des forces armées russes, mais aussi des milices privées, notamment la milice Wagner, qui fait parler de ses sinistres exploits dans le pays, mais aussi ailleurs. La Fédération de Russie s'est rendue coupable d'exactions dont l'atrocité heurte la conscience et notre conception de la vie et de la dignité humaine. Ces exactions de toute nature, je l'ai déjà exprimé ici, crimes de guerre, voire crimes contre l'humanité, appellent bien évidemment une condamnation de la part de la justice internationale. La délégation que je préside, délégation française, a eu l'honneur de recevoir la délégation ukrainienne conduite par Madame Menzetsva, à l'Assemblée nationale, mais aussi au Sénat, pour évoquer la constitution d'un crime d'agression qui engloberait les différents crimes qu'a dû endurer l'Ukraine depuis le 24 février 2022. Je veux redire ici ce que nous avons collectivement dit à nos collègues ukrainiens. Cette rencontre a été l'occasion d'échanges sur la création d'un tribunal pénal international spécial en charge de sanctionner les diverses exactions commises par la Fédération de Russie sur le territoire ukrainien. Nous soutenons sans réserve le principe d'un jugement des responsables des crimes, quels que soient les moyens choisis pour y parvenir. En effet, le fait que ni la Russie ni l'Ukraine ne soient partis au statut de Rome instituant la CPI, il sera nécessaire d'explorer les voies et les moyens pour la création d'un tribunal ad hoc. Le 30 novembre dernier, l'Assemblée nationale française a appuyé cette position en votant une résolution appelant, je cite, l'Union européenne et ses États membres a continué de soutenir sans retenue la Cour pénale internationale dans son travail d'enquête sur tout possible crime de guerre ou crime contre l'humanité commis sur le territoire ukrainien depuis le début de l'agression, afin que les coupables de tels crimes puissent être jugés 
par la Cour pénale internationale ou, le cas échéant, par un tribunal ad hoc à l'issue du conflit. D'ores et déjà, le gouvernement français a décidé de déployer des enquêteurs de la Gendarmerie nationale française dans la région d'Izium, et je salue l'engagement de la Gendarmerie. Il faut bien évidemment poursuivre la collecte et la conservation sur le terrain des preuves de crimes de guerre et de crimes contre l'humanité. Et je rejoins mon collègue Gatolin pour que notre commissaire se saisisse de cette situation, notre commissaire aux droits de l'homme. C'est au prix de la justice pour les victimes et de la sanction pour les bourreaux que notre continent retrouvera la paix, une paix pérenne. La France et son Parlement se tiennent prêts à appuyer toute démarche allant dans ce sens. Je vous remercie. Merci à vous, Bertrand. I now have to interrupt the list of speakers, but bear in mind that the speeches of those members on the speakers list, and there are still a lot of them, who were, have been present during the debate but have not been able to speak, may be given to the table office for publication in our official report. I remind colleagues that typewritten text must be submitted electronically no later than four hours after the list of speakers is interrupted. I now call Mr. Cotier, uh, the rapporteur, to reply. You have three minutes, Damien. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Et je me réjouis que le débat se termine avec cette déclaration forte du président de la délégation française, qui fait écho à des déclarations de, de nombreux pays et de nombreuses institutions. Il y a deux jours ici, la ministre des Affaires étrangères allemande. Il y a quelques jours, le gouvernement né néerlandais. Il n'y a pas si longtemps, la, commission, la présidente de la Commission européenne. Et de nombreux pays et gouvernements qui plaident euh, en faveur de, cette, de la création de ce tribunal international pour le crime d'agression que notre Assemblée avait déjà porté euh, fortement, enfin à l'unanimité, euh, lors de son débat du mois d'avril. Du mois euh, M. Goncharenko, vous nous avez fait entendre euh, ces sirènes et la délégation de, de dix membres de cette Assemblée qui s'est rendue à Kiev euh, au mois de juin l'année dernière l'a vécu. En pleine discussion avec le ministère des Affaires étrangères, les sirènes ont, ont retenti et nous avons dû nous déplacer. Et moi, je viens de Suisse un pays qui connaît la paix depuis 175 ans. C'est évidemment quelque chose de terriblement déstabilisant d'entendre ça. Et en discutant avec la population, en discutant avec vous, les membres de la délégation ukrainienne, on a, on a compris à quel point c'est devenu votre quotidien, comme vous l'avez mentionné ce matin. Les, les, les gens se réveillent avec cela. Et J'entendais hier à la radio que le premier mot prononcé hier par un petit garçon était « bombe » au lieu d'être « papa » ou « maman ». Les enfants se réveillent avec cela. Et j'ai été frappé, comme nous avons tous été frappés dans la délégation, de voir à quel point euh, le peuple ukrainien est résilient et veut vivre normalement malgré ces bombes qui tombent tous les jours et malgré ces alarmes qui sonnent en permanence. Et nous devons évidemment euh, vous soutenir dans cela parce que c'est un combat pour, pour la liberté. Alors vous avez évoqué les, les aspects militaires et comme l'a dit... Comme sur Edward Lay, tout à l'heure, ça n'est pas l'objet des discussions dans cet euh, hémicycle, ça n'est pas les thèmes du Conseil de l'Europe, bien évidemment, ils doivent, ces discussions doivent se faire, mais elles doivent se faire euh, dans d'autres endroits. Et nous comprenons bien l'attention euh, que vous mentionnez, parce que tout simplement, si l'Ukraine arrête la guerre, il n'y a plus d'Ukraine, alors que si la Russie arrête la guerre, il n'y a plus de guerre. Et c'est évidemment ce que nous appelons... La, la Russie à faire. Mais ici, nous devons travailler, comme l'a souligné Mme Mezenseva et d'autres, euh, sur l'aspect de la justice pour préparer la paix, pour reconstruire cette paix. Et il y a ces trois aspects, ces trois piliers, je remercie tous les groupes de les avoir soutenus, le mécanisme d'indemnisation, la question euh, de, de soutenir les autorités en place, et notamment la CPI et les autorités judiciaires ukrainiennes, pour lutter contre, pour enquêter et, et, et rendre justice sur les crimes de guerre, les crimes contre l'humanité, et possiblement le crime de génocide, et puis la création de ce tribunal euh, d'agression qui ne doit pas, M. Katougalos, qui ne doit pas affaiblir la CPI, qui doit au contraire travailler de manière proche avec elle, qui doit euh, la renforcer en fait, mais qui est nécessaire en complément pour les raisons que nous avons évoquées parce que la CPI n'a pas ce mandat. Et bien évidemment qu'il faut signer, il faut que les pays signent et ratifient le statut de Rome et les amendements de Kampala, mais il faut le faire en complément avec la création de ce tribunal 
internationale. Merci à tous les groupes politiques pour soutenir les propositions de ce rapport. Comme l'a dit Mme evars dotir c'est une roadmap euh, vers la, la justice. Et j'aimerais citer simplement Mme Madvitsouk, que je remercie encore une fois pour ses témoignages poignants. Euh, pour conclure, « We must do it because it is the right thing to do », avez-vous dit, nous devons le faire parce que c'est la chose juste à faire. Votons maintenant et puisse ce message porté jusqu'à Reykjavik auprès du sommet des chefs d'État et de gouvernement. Je vous remercie. Merci à vous, monsieur le rapporteur. Uh, does the vice chairperson of the committee, Mr. Davor Ivo, Davor Ivo Steele, wishes to speak? You have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, uh, dear Alexandra. Uh, let me start by thanking the rapporteur for his work as well as the Secretariat for uh, their dedication. This report is based on a motion for a resolution table on the 17th of March 2022, the day after the expulsion of the Russian Federation from the Council of Europe. Now, the Committee on Legal Affairs has examined already some of the aspects covered by this report in an urgent debate report on the Russian Federation's aggression, ensuring accountability for the serious violation of international humanitarian law and other international crimes, which was prepared by Alexander Poche as rapporteur in April 2022. At that time, the Assembly unanimously called for the establishment of a special tribunal on the crime of aggression committed against Ukraine. And let's not forget, this Assembly was the first international body to do so. The current report prepared by our Chairman, Damien Coutier, develops the proposal in more detail and recommends concrete action to Member States, the Council of Europe and other international actors. It also deals with two other key aspects of the accountability for the violations of international law. And one is the accountability for uh, other international crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. And the second one is the compensation for all the damage and loss resulting from the Russian aggression against Ukraine. After three hearings with experts on the three different topics, the committee asked the Bureau to fast track the report and examine it under the urgent debate procedure. We consider that the Assembly should send a strong and unified message to our heads of state and governments meeting in Reykjavik in May. This week, we heard from the Secretary General of the Council of Europe that the organization was ready to play its part and contribute to ensure accountability, and that the aggression against Ukraine will be at the center of the summit. So, dear colleagues, with this resolution, supported unanimously by our committee on Tuesday, the Assembly will send a clear message to the world. The serious violations of international law committed by Russia and its leaders against one of our member states will not go unpunished. Peace can only be achieved through justice and accountability. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Steer. The debate is closed now. The Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights has presented a draft resolution which you find in document 15689, to which seven amendments have been tabled. We will also consider three sub-amendments. I remind you that speeches on amendments are limited to 30 seconds. I understand that the Vice Chairperson of the Committee of Legal Affairs and Human Rights wishes to propose to the Assembly that amendments 5 and 6 to the draft resolution, which were unanimously approved by the Committee, should be declared as agreed by the Assembly. Is that so, Mr. Steer? Yeah, that's correct. Does anybody object? I don't see so. That means that amendments 5 and 6 to the draft resolution have been agreed. I also understand that the Vice Chairperson of the Committee wishes to propose to the Assembly that the amendments 1, 2 and 3 to the draft resolution which were rejected by the committee with a two-thirds majority be declared as rejected by the assembly. Is that so, Mr. Steer? It's correct. <coughs> is there any objection? I do not see so. As there is no objection, I declare that the amendments 1, 2, and 3 to the draft resolution are rejected. I now call Madam Selin sayek Beuke to support amendment number 7. Céline, you have 30 seconds. I do not see her here. Is there anybody else who wants to move 
Amendment number seven. Madam Scow, perhaps amendment number seven has, would you move it formally, perhaps? So I do not have the text in front of me, so, uh, uh, <laughs> but, but then I have moved it so you can vote to it. The amendment is moved formally so we can uh, take it into account. Uh, does anybody wish, uh, uh, wish uh, uh, no, I have been informed that uh, Mr. Cochet de Rapporteur wishes to propose an oral subamendment as follows. Replace the word procedures with all the relevant procedures and delete all the text in the parentheses. The amendment would then read as follows. The Assembly also calls on the Ukrainian authorities to put particular emphasis on activating all the relevant procedures to gather information on and ensure the safe return of forcefully transferred Ukrainian children from the Russian Federation and the Russian occupied territories. In my opinion, the oral subamendment is in order under our rules. However, if 10 or more members object, the oral subamendment being debated, I do not see any objection. Then I ask Mr. Cochet to support his oral subamendment. Damien? Oui, merci, Monsieur le Président. <coughs> D'abord, tout à l'heure, pardonnez-moi de l'avoir oublié dans, dans l'émotion du moment. J'aurais aussi dû euh, dire un mot pour remercier le, le secrétariat, en particulier euh, Guilhem Cagno Valorames, pour l'excellent travail de soutien qui a été donné à la, à la Commission et au rapporteur. C'est vraiment un, un privilège de travailler dans de telles conditions. Concernant cette, cette, ce sous-amendement, il s'agit simplement de préciser les choses parce que certaines des institutions qui sont citées le sont de manière imprécise. Et par conséquent, il n'y a pas besoin de les citer de manière autant détaillée, mais il vaut mieux parler de toutes les, relevues, les, les, les procédures euh, nécessaires de manière à, à être au fond plus précis dans le texte. Merci, Damien. Does anybody wish to speak to the oral subamendment? Do you not see any objection? What is the opinion of the mover of the amendment, Madame Scow? I agree. Thank you very much. The committee is obviously in favour, Mr. Steer. I now will put the subamendment, the oral subamendment, to the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I call for the results to be displayed. And the oral sub-amendment is carried. We will now consider the main amendment as amended. Does anybody wish to speak against the amendment as amended? I do not see any. The committee is obviously in favor, Mr. Steer. Uh, I now shall put amendment number seven as amended to the floor. The, floor, and the vote is open. The vote is closed. I call for the results to be displayed. The amendment is carried. Which page? Uh, I now, uh, we now move to amendment number four and an oral sub-amendment. The oral sub-amendments do it. I call Mr. Vasilenko to support amendment number four. You have 30 seconds. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, this amendment uh, regards uh, the, the recommendations of the Assembly uh, to unblock uh, the United uh, Nations and the Security Council, which today is paralyzed by uh, the veto power of Russia's Federation. And essentially, uh, what we are saying is uh, that w we want the UN to return to a rule-based society and the International Court of Justice to give its opinion jurors on the matter. So I ask to support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Reisha. I have been informed that Mr. Cochier, rapporteur, wishes to propose two oral subamendments, which have to be dealt with separately. We will now consider the oral subamendment one to amendment number four. Your first oral subamendment would delete the second sentence of amendment four. In my opinion, this oral subamendment is in order under our rules. 
However, if 10 or more members do object to it to be debated, I do not see. So then I call on Mr. Cochet to, to support um, uh, Subamendment 1 to Amendment 4. Damien. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Le, le constat que fait cet amendement est, est juste euh, du problème grave que pose le, le, le blocage au Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies. Néanmoins, nous estimons qu'il n'appartient pas au Conseil de l'Europe de proposer à une autre organisation internationale de la manière de se réformer et que le constat et l'appel à faire une modification est suffisante dans le reste du texte et que par conséquent, il vaudrait mieux supprimer cette phrase qui parle d'une autre organisation internationale que la nôtre. Euh, no, notre, no, nos compétences, finalement, euh, sont de s'occuper du fonctionnement de notre organisation, éventuellement un appel aux États, mais pas de modifier une autre organisation internationale comme les Nations Unies. Merci, Monsieur le rapporteur. Does anyone wish to speak against the oral sub-amendment I do not see any. What is the, the committee is obviously in favor, uh, Mr. Steer, of the sub uh, oral sub-amendment, so I will now put it to the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I call for the results to be displayed and the oral sub-amendment is carried. We now will consider uh, the oral sub-amendment sub number two to amendment two. I have been informed that Mr. Cochet wishes to propose an oral sub-amendment as follows. Leave out in the last sentence from as well to Estonia and Poland. In my opinion, the oral sub-amendment is in order under our rules. However, if 10 or more members object, the oral sub-amendment to be debated, not the case. Uh, then, uh, does any, the, then I call Mr. Cochet to support his oral sub-amendment number two. Monsieur le Président, la question euh, est juridiquement euh, très peu discutée. La succession euh, de l'URSS par la Russie a été admise par la communauté internationale depuis euh, une trentaine d'années, plus de 30 ans. Et, et donc les, les chances de succès d'une telle, telle requête sont extrêmement faibles et il nous semble que c'est affaiblir euh, la résolution de l'Assemblée que d'introduire une, une, telle, une telle demande. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous proposons d'en rester à ce que l'Assemblée la, a déjà décidé avec l'avis la, la de la Cour internationale de justice, mais ne pas ajouter cette dimension de la succession d'États. Je vous remercie. Merci, Monsieur le rapporteur. Does anyone wish to speak against this oral sub-amendment I do not see what is the, the opinion of the mover of the amendment. Leisha. Uh, uh, merci, je suis d'accord avec uh, le sous-amendement comme on a discuté dans la commission. Merci. Favor. In favor, thank you very much. The committee, obviously, Mr. Steer, is in favor of the sub-amendment. I will now put sub oral sub-amendment number two to the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I call for the results to be displayed and the order sub amendment is carried. We will now consider the main amendment as amended. Does anybody wish to speak against the main amendment as amended? Do not see. The committee, Mr. Steer, is obviously in favor. I now shall put amendment number four as amended to the vote. The vote is open. Well done. The vote is closed. I call for the results to be displayed. And the amendment number four is carried. We now will proceed to vote on the draft resolution contained in document 15689 as amended. A simple majority is required. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I call for the results to be displayed. And the resolution has been adopted unanimously. Thank you very much. And also, thank you very much, Madam Alessandra Matvichuk, for participating not only addressing our, uh, our assembly, but also participating in the debate. And congratulations, Mr. Rapporteur. We will wait a few moments.
uh, and then uh, we are going to listen to the address of the Prime Minister of Iceland, chairing the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. Get not force. Dear colleagues, may I now ask you to take your seats. Okay, one picture, and then we are going to proceed with our agenda. So again, please take your seats, colleagues. On Tuesday, we had a former member of our assembly addressing our hemicycle in a new capacity as Foreign Affairs Minister of Germany. Now we will listen to another former colleague of us addressing us now in her new capacity, actual capacity, cannot say new, actual capacity as Prime Minister of Iceland, Madam Katrin Jacobs. Be most welcome, Katrin. The Prime Minister's communication uh, address will include the communication from the Committee of Ministers of the Assembly as Iceland is chairing our Committee of Ministers. Therefore, I said to the Prime Minister that for us, she is now the most important politician in the whole of Europe. Madam Prime Minister, you are now chairing the presidency of the Council, Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe in a most critical, perhaps existential time in history. Through its unprovoked and unjustified war of aggression against Ukraine, the Russian Federation continues to violate international law with its military actions, committing atrocities against Ukrainians and undermining Europe and global security and stability. Today, it is clear that the work of the Council of Europe, based on the promotion and the protection of human rights, democracy and the rule of law, is perhaps more vital than ever. This crisis has brought the founding principle of the Council of Europe in sharp focus. The pursuit of peace can only be achieved through justice and international cooperation. That is why we are looking forward to the fourth summit of heads of state and government, which will take place on the 16th and the 17th of May in Reykjavik, a summit that the Assembly has been calling for and which will renew and reinforce the mandate of the Council of Europe in the face of these new challenges. And I can tell the Assembly that I will also convene a meeting of the Standing Committee the day before the summit, also in Reykjavik, so that also the parliamentary dimension will be represented in the great capital of Iceland. The effort of each and every country is now needed to safeguard the multilateral system created more than 70 years ago to protect peace. It is important to acknowledge Iceland's solid commitment and contribution to face the destructive currents which threaten to unravel our European systems of cohesion and cooperation. Therefore, Madam Prime Minister, dear Catherine, your presence here is highly appreciated by us all. It, de it demonstrates the dedication of your great country to our Council's core values. 
and therefore we are really looking forward to your intervention and then followed by an exchange of, food, of views. Please, Madam Prime Minister, can I invite you to take the floor? Thank you, Mr. President, for your kind words. Uh, Secretary General, Secretary General of the Assembly, distinguished parliamentarians and distinguished ambassadors. And maintenant, plusieurs mots en français. C'est un honneur de m'adresser à vous aujourd'hui au nom de la présidence islandaise du Conseil de l'Europe et à l'approche du quatrième sommet du chef d'État et du gouvernement qui se tiendra à Reykjavik en mai prochain. J'ai eu le plaisir de rencontrer certains d'entre vous en novembre dernier, lorsque l'Alsingi, le Parlement islandais, a accueilli le comité permanent euh, en Islande. Avant de devenir Premier ministre, comme le Président a déjà dit, j'ai été membre de cette Assemblée pendant une brève période et j'ai eu l'occasion de participer à votre important travail et d'apprendre de première main le rôle clé de l'Assemblée parlementaire comme forum pour la discussion démocratique en Europe et en tant que catalyseur d'idées et d'action nouvelle. And now I will switch over to English. It's always so nice to remember your French, not least here in Strasbourg. I must say, dear friends, that this assembly has shown vigor and resilience when responding to major crises in the past few years. It was able to adapt its procedures to continuing its work through the pandemic, stressing the need to balance social restrictions with human rights and highlighting, among other things, the detrimental impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable groups. Following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this assembly demonstrated its unity around the values upon which the Council of Europe was founded by condemning Russia's aggression and by recommending its expulsion from the Council of Europe. A very swift response. Dear friends, Iceland was the 12th state to join the Council of Europe in 1950, only six years after we became a republic. Our membership has played an important part in the advancement of human rights and the rule of law in Iceland. Judgments by the European Court of Human Rights are fundamental to the organization's core role to advance and protect fundamental rights. Full and unequivocal respect for and execution of the court's judgments are therefore a shared responsibility of all member states. The Council of Europe, the European Court of Human Rights and its system of legal conventions constantly remind us of our obligations and have made valuable suggestions for improvements in guaranteeing citizens' rights. As a forum for dialogue and cooperation, the Council of Europe has been instrumental in safeguarding, implementing and promoting fundamental values and principles. This is no simple task, because democracy can be complicated, cumbersome, and even messy, with demanding and lengthy debates. Yet it is precisely the need for time, the need for patience, that makes democratic governance effective. And therein lies our strength to express different opinions, to debate openly and freely, and to look for common solutions based on our core values and the interests of our citizens. The democratic concept, which lies at the core of the European Convention on Human Rights, is an inclusive concept. It requires that the interests of all are taken into account, including rights and interests of the weak and the vulnerable. And this is what we all must continue fighting for. Dear colleagues, Iceland takes over the presidency of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe at a critical time. Uh, Eleven months have passed since the launch of Russia's full-scale attack on Ukraine. And tragedy and violence are not only confined to the battlegrounds. Russia's systematic attacks on civilian infrastructure has caused much human suffering and hardship. Millions of innocent civilians have fled their homes. Horrendous reports of atrocities sexual and gender-based violence, and other grave human rights violations have fueled a sense of urgency we all feel. 
the end of ending this war, bringing our continent back to peace, and that was, after all, the founding ideal of the Council of Europe after the end of the Second World War. The furtherance of peace lies at the genesis of our common European project. This Council, the Council of Europe, has taken a firm stance against Russia's aggression against the Ukraine, which is a clear violation of international law as embedded in the United Nations Charter as well as that of the Statutes of Council of Europe. Victims of the war and displaced persons are also suffering violations of their rights and freedoms under the European Convention of Human Rights, as well as international humanitarian law. Most member states, including Iceland, are part of the sanctions regime against Russia and have provided material support for Ukraine. The ultimate goal is a just peace that respects international law and the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And justice also requires a comprehensive system of accountability for human rights violations and international crimes to avoid impunity and to prevent further violations. Iceland supports efforts to document crimes committed by Russia and Ukraine and to bring the perpetrators to justice. Given the makeup of the UN Security Council, major political hurdles stand in the way of establishing international tribunals, such as those created after the wars in the former Yugoslavia or the genocide in Rwanda, or involve the International Criminal Court without a Russian membership. However, the rights of victims must be recognized and violations rem remedied as far as possible. I recall the landmark opinion of the Parliamentary Assembly from the 15th of March on the consequences of the Russian Federation's aggression against Ukraine, where the Assembly made clear that it constituted a crime against peace, an aggression under international law, and moreover, a serious breach of the statutes of the Council of Europe. In order for us to be able to honor the rights and the fundamental human dignity of victims, some forms of retributive and restorative justice are needed to deal with wartime atrocities in Ukraine. And as experience shows, such mechanism of accountability can have transformative effects. And this was, for example, the case when sexual violence and rape in armed conflict were defined as a war crime and a crime against humanity following the violent breakup of the former Yugoslavia and with the actions of various truth commissions set up in post-conflict states on the model of the South African, African example. And in my view, the Council of Europe should address the question of justice and accountability in its summit declaration. Dear colleagues, war does not only undermine the principles of cooperation in the international system. It also threatens democracy, it violates human rights, and dismantles the rule of law. We also see evidence of other types of threats to democratic values in Europe and around the world. In the United States and more recently Brazil, we have seen attacks against the very institutions that have been put in place to safeguard democracy. The independence of the judiciary has been challenged in some European countries. We have witnessed a worrying backlash against gender equality and LGBTI rights. These are not isolated events, but a manifestation of a broader trend where democratic principles are questioned or rejected. There is a tendency to think that democracies perish as a result of a violent action, such as military coups or aggression. But in our time, they can also be undermined by other overt means or wither away in silence. We have witnessed elected leaders coming to power through parliamentary means, who then engage in authoritarian power grabs aimed at eliminating democratic checks and balances. We have also seen non-democratic states with no interest in promotion of equality or human rights emerging as major players on the international scene. We can debate whether it matters more that democratic states are becoming fewer or less democratic. Yet, as I said, democratic rights can be suppressed or they can slip away 
And for this reason, they have to be fought for, nurtured and protected. We need the multilateral system to weather the storms we currently face. If there is one lesson to be learned from the failure of the international response to fascism in the 1930s, it is that democracies must stay together to protect hard-won political rights and freedoms. The priorities of the Icelandic presidency of the Council of Europe reflect this commitment to fundamental values and to multilateral cooperation. And, but we will also use this platform to champion the rights of women and girls, the environment, and children and youth. The presidency will focus on four main themes. First, Iceland will have a strong focus on the Council's core principles of human rights, democracy and rule of law. We must return to our fundamental principles and the framework that has kept us together. And in a time of democratic decline and rising authoritarianism, the Council of Europe serves a critical function as a guardian of democracy. Second, the Icelandic presidency will engage with critical issues regarding human rights, automation and the environment. The impact of new technologies needs to be addressed to ensure that they serve the people and strengthen democratic processes and human rights instead of undermining basic values. We have to search for common answers to pressing questions about the use of artificial intelligence how the protection of human rights can be safeguarded while realizing the contribution of neural networks to social prosperity and well-being. We must deal with the detrimental effects of the climate crisis on human rights across the world. The right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment has been recognized by the United Nations General Assembly. And last October, this assembly recommended that the right to a healthy environment be established through an additional protocol to the European Convention of Human Rights. The Committee of Ministers now has the task of figuring out how this right can be formalized in the Council of Europe Convention system. Even though this will take some time, we do not want to lose the momentum that this issue has gained in the past two years. In May, the Icelandic Presidency will organize an event on the margins of the meeting of the Drafting Committee on Human Rights and the Environment of the Committee of Ministers, focusing on the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. We will examine how states have incorporated the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment into their legislation and promote green public administration and other ecologically sound solutions. Responding to the climate crisis is our most urgent generational challenge and I think the Council of Europe has a very important part to play there. Third, we will put much emphasis on the rights of children and young people. Every child has the right to grow into adulthood in health, peace and dignity and it's imperative for all states to ensure these rights. Iceland will and has already been promoting child-centered policy making through integrating services and protection systems for children. An early model of this approach is the Icelandic Barnahus or Children's House, a child-friendly interdisciplinary and multi-agent response center for child sexual abuse. Its unique approach brings together all relevant services under one roof to avoid re-victimization of children during the investigation and court proceedings where the rights of the child are paramount. Another priority will be the inclusion of young people in decision-making. We will organize consultative meetings with young people during our presidency, and we want to ensure that their voices will be heard in the lead-up to the Reykjavik summit. Fourth, Iceland is steadfast in its commitment to equality and the protection of hard-earned rights of women and girls around the world. While important gains have been made in the fight against gender-based violence over decades of activism, new forms of violence have emerged. During Iceland's presidency, we will continue to focus specifically on action against digital violence and the role of men and boys in gender equality policies. As technology evolves and our use of it changes, we see new representations of gender-based violence primarily harming women and girls. And we need to be alert to these forms of violence and how they impact victims in a way that can discourage civic participation, activism and involvement in politics, ultimately harming our democracies. 
I would like to underline specifically the important role of the Istanbul Convention in preventing and combating violence against women and domestic violence. The Convention, which has been ratified by 37 Council of Europe member states, is the most comprehensive and far-reaching instrument of its kind, and its implementation has had a significant effect. And I sincerely hope that more member states and non-member states will sign and ratify the Convention in coming years. Let me also stress that Iceland is firmly committed to promoting and protecting the rights of LGBTI individuals and to creating a safe, inclusive and enabling environment for the advancement of human rights and equality for all. We must continue to educate, we must continue to listen and always speak up when we witness hate, prejudice and discrimination. We are all part of this effort and we cannot leave the fight for equality to the LGBTI community alone. An inclusive and equal society where every member is treated with respect and dignity is a goal that we must all subscribe to. Dear friends, to conclude, I see the Reykjavik summit as an important opportunity for heads of state and government of the 46 member states to convene and unite around our values to work towards strengthening the organization to meet current and future challenges. The aim of the Icelandic presidency is to consult with all relevant stakeholders, including the Council of Europe bodies, international organizations, youth representatives and civil society. And we will do our utmost for the next few months, together with the member states, to ensure that the fourth summit will be productive and fulfill the demands made of the Council. The input of the Parliamentary Assembly, and it's more than 300 parliamentarians, is crucial to the success of this summit. As mentioned in our timeline, Road to Reykjavik, the Icelandic Presidency prioritized consultations with the Assembly in preparing for the meeting. The most important input of the Assembly is the recommendation to the Committee of Ministers on the Reykjavik Summit adopted on Tuesday. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Rapporteur, Mrs. Piano Olaflin, for her excellent work. Our aim is to deliver a substantive summit declaration focusing on the most pressing issues. And my wish is that the Reykjavik Declaration reflects the following. A resolute recommitment to our fundamental values and principle, a very clear support for Ukraine, where the issue of accountability is addressed, and meaningful decisions to guide our work in meeting urgent challenges such as the climate crisis and rapid technological changes, which are having major effects on human rights. Later this afternoon, we will have the opportunity to discuss the summit in the Joint Committee of the Assembly and the Committee of Ministers. And we will keep the Assembly informed of the progress in the coming months, notably in the Standing Committee in March and the April plenary session. The Council of Europe was born out of the tragedy of the Second World War, with the clear aim of uniting Europe and ensuring that its violent past would not become its future. And during these times we are living now, this mission has never been more important. We look forward to working closely with all member states and statutory bodies of the organization to promote the vision of a strong and effective Council of Europe, firmly committed to its core values of human rights, rule of law and democracy in our continent. And I believe that this institution, this body, the Council of Europe is essential for the future of Europe, the future of Europe that we want our children and grandchildren to grow up in and live in. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Prime Minister, for your address. Uh, and you also have agreed that you would now uh, be involved in an exchange of views. But before starting, I use the fact that I'm 